And that's what we want to hear about those heroes of Islam, those great pioneers of Islam, those great warriors of Islam, so we could be affected by their characters and become like them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for us the best of people for us to follow. Because the reality is a human being in general, he is a follower of someone else. And if you look into your life or the life of someone else, their life and actions is based on someone that they look up to. Whether in an educational field or social field or in sports or whatever field they are in, you find that their characters are affected by others that they look up to. And that's why they try and act like them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for us the greatest human being that he had created to be our example, to be the role model that we look up to, and that's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, who are our great heroes. They are our great heroes. Yes, they are our great heroes that we look up to. Bismillah I've been given, given the honor to introduce our great Sheikh, Sheikh Shaidi al Suleiman. Sheikh Shaidi al Suleiman was born in Sydney, Australia, into an Arab family who migrated to the country in the late 60s. He completed his primary education in Sydney and afterwards he traveled overseas to start a journey for Islamic education and receiving the Islamic knowledge in the Islamic world. He initially traveled to Pakistan, studied there. He received an ijazah with the Sanad back to the Prophet in complete and sound memorization of the Quran. He afterwards went to Damascus in Syria and studied with many well-known scholars and well on very well many well-known institutions studying the Arabic language, the Islamic sciences and so on. He specialized in the Arabic language and the, the field of comparative fiqh. He received numerous ijazas in fiqh, usul fiqh, hadith and many other, many other Islamic disciplines as well. He currently resides in Sydney, Australia where he works in the field of da'wah, spreading the message of Islam in the community, contributing to the society, and he's especially active with the Muslim Australian youth of the country, giving lectures in the masjids, he travels around the world, gives speeches, spreads the message of Islam, spreads the deen of Allah, and he also operates from, operates from the largest Islamic masjid in the country, Last year he also attended the conference in Oslo, Norway, the yearly conference, Peace Conference Scandinavia, where many 
lecturers, du'at, scholars come and give lectures from all around the world, spreading the message of Islam, spreading the deen of Allah to the wider society. Without any further, further ado, I would request our Shaykh, Shaykh Shaydi al Suleiman, to give his great lecture, Heroes of Islam. All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I testify that there is no God except Allah Almighty and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah. First of all, brothers and sisters in Stockholm, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm so happy, delighted, and honored to be amongst you today. And wallahi, just to see you and to be amongst you makes me forget the 35 hour flight that I came from down under. And wallahi, there is nothing more greater to see that even though we live in different parts of the world, I live in one of the last, in one of the furthest countries down under, and you live in the furthest country above and above, as they say. And Alhamdulillah, what unites us and brings us together is that beautiful word, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And what makes us share that respect between one another is that beautiful deen Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon us with the beautiful ni'mah, the beautiful bounty of Islam, that we are Muslims, not because we just say we are Muslims, it's because we believe we are Muslims, we adhere to the teachings of Islam, and Alhamdulillah, we are united under that beautiful banner, the banner of Islam. I'm so happy to see that young brothers and sisters attending the conference. And maybe this is a beginning for you in Stockholm, inshallah, to initiate the Da'wah projects and to start the programs and the conferences and the lectures and the da'wah activities like how our brothers in Oslo started how we started 10 years ago in Australia and every every start there's a beginning and alhamdulillah this is a beautiful beginning that we have to see a great prosperous and fruitful da'wah activities coming out of this bidnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala my brothers and sisters in Islam we live for the da'wah and this is what we need to know, every single one of us. Every single one of us has the responsibility of the da'wah. I have the responsibility of being a da'i. You have the responsibility of being a da'i. And the word da'i in Arabic means a preacher, a caller, an advocator to the truth, which is Islam. What we have this misunderstanding about that only a da'i is a sheikh or an imam or someone who's qualified, or someone who's been studying, or someone who's an Imam. This is wrong. And it's wrong for us to continue thinking that way. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not tell the Sahaba only those who studied can call to Allah. And he did not tell the Sahaba only those who memorize the Quran Kareem can call to Allah. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not tell those who've been longer in Islam than others that they could call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But his teaching sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clearly teaches us that the moment you embrace Islam and the moment you become a part of this beautiful religion and the moment you are a Muslim is that moment that you are automatically also a da'i. Yes, the moment you enter this deen, the moment you adhere to Islam and the moment you follow Islam, you are automatically a da'i, especially in Western countries, especially in countries that we live in, where I come from, from Australia and you are in Sweden. We all have the responsibility of the da'wah in our lives. And this is the beauty of this deen, that we all share the same load of responsibility upon us in different ways. We all share the load of responsibility, that we're all responsible to advocate and call for this beautiful religion, Islam. 
but we share it in different ways. What I can do is different to what you can do, and what you can do is different to what I can do. And therefore, you need to take upon this responsibility that you can do better than everyone else, and I need to take upon this responsibility that I might think or believe I could do better than everyone else. And this is the beauty of our Islamic history, heroes of Islam and in Islam. You see that character in them, that beautiful character in them, that they became heroes, not because, wallahi, their names were Muhammad or Ahmad or Umar or Mahmoud, but they were heroes because they were advocates to this beautiful religion. They were warriors to this deen. They upheld Islam. They fought for Islam. They stood up for Islam. And they sacrificed their entire life for Islam. They lived for Islam. They died for Islam. They upheld everything they could do to uphold Islam. And this is what we need to do is follow their path and legacy. Is that we need to live for Islam. And the unfortunate thing is we are Muslims. And we live as Muslims, but we don't live for Islam. We are born as Muslims. And I know I am a Muslim, but is Islam in my life? Because the reality is, when you look at the life of many Muslims these days, the only thing they have from Islam is the name of Islam and nothing beyond that. We need to live for Islam. I need my life to be Islam. That if someone looks at me, knows that you're a Muslim, not because your name is Ahmad or Muhammad or Fatima or Aisha, it's because your actions resemble Islam. And that's the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about the character of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, she said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ القرآن. She said that the menace of the Prophet Muhammad was the Quran. He was a walking Quran on the surface of this earth. Walking Quran, what a beautiful description. In Nabi was a walking Quran on the surface of this earth. With what? With his actions. His life was the Quran. His actions were the Qur'an. His morals was the Qur'an. His ethics was following the Qur'an. His entire life is based on the Qur'an that he was described to be a walking Qur'an. And we need every single one of us to be the walking Qur'an, the walking Islam. Walking Islam, walking Qur'an through your actions. Walking Islam, walking Quran through your character, through your morals, through your ethics, through your manners. And that's why we want to come out of this. We want to come out understanding that I need to live Islam. I need to live it in my life. My actions, my life, my manners, my morals has got to be Islam. And that's why I live for Islam. My entire life is based on Islam. Not just to listen to stories about great heroes of Islam. And this is a problem that we have is we listen and we walk out as if we didn't even listen. We want to learn. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to command the Sahaba to do something, by the time they walk out of the mosque, it's in their life. These days, by the time we walk out of the mosque, the little theater is left behind. We need to put it into practicality. We need to put it into reality in our lives. And that's why we want to hear about those heroes of Islam, those great pioneers of Islam, those great warriors of Islam, so it could be affected by their characters and become like them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for us the best of people for us to follow. Because the reality is a human being in general, he is a follower of someone else. And if you look into your life or the life of someone else, their life and actions is based on someone that they look up to. Whether in an educational field or social field or in sports 
or whatever field they are in, you find that their characters are affected by others that they look up to. And that's why they try and act like them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for us the greatest human being that He had created to be our example, to be the role model that we look up to, and that's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, who are our great heroes. They are our great heroes. Yes, they are our great heroes that we look up to. We love them, we look up to them, and we follow them. Not only that we just love them, because I do not doubt a Muslim that does not love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every Muslim loves the Prophet Even those Muslims who do not even pray, even those Muslims who are committing the haram, even the gangster Muslim on the street, he loves Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I don't doubt that he loves the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. But their problem is, and our problem in general is that we don't follow Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam and that's a big problem. That's a huge problem. We need not just to love the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. We need to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our actions and life is going to be in accordance to the way of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Because the only way that Allah azza wa jalla will ever accept from us is the way of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. And the only path to the paradise is the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Allah Almighty, your Lord, He says in Surah Al Imran, Say, say if you love Allah, then follow me. Follow who? Follow who? Follow the Hollywood actors? Follow the gangsters on the street? Follow who? Bob or Jack? Follow me. Who is me here? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is saying, O oh Muhammad, say to them, say to people, to you and me, if you want Allah to love you, and you want Allah to be pleased from you, and you want Allah to forgive you, and you want Allah to admit you into the paradise, then you must follow me. Me is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and no one else but Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam. يَحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Allah will love you in return, and Allah will forgive your sins, as He is the most forgiving and the most merciful Almighty. So if you want the pleasure of Allah, and you want Allah to love you in return, and you want Allah to grant you the paradise that you are living for, then you must follow who? Follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The greatest hero ever stepped foot on the surface of this earth sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is greater than Muhammad? Who is better than Muhammad? Who is more of a hero than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There is no one greater than him as a human being alayhi salatu wa sallam. There is no one better than him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is no greater hero than Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam. And therefore, he is my hero, your hero, and the hero of not only Muslims, but non-Muslims and human beings to the day of judgment sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he is the chosen hero that Allah had chose to mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Verily, O oh Muhammad, and indeed, we had sent you as a mercy to mankind. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is indeed a mercy to mankind. A mercy that Allah Azza wa Jal will have mercy upon us when we follow Him. A mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us when we emulate Him. 
I mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will descend upon us when we follow his footsteps sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says alayhi salatu wa sallam, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من ماله وولده والناس أجمعين that none of you will become a true believer. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, none of you will become a true believer until I, the messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger and the prophet of Allah, until I become more beloved to them than their families, than their children, than their parents, than everyone else, including themselves. Once again, once again I say what the Prophet ﷺ said and pay attention. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says, none of you will become a true believer until I become more beloved to them than their families, than their children than their parents, than their friends, than their mates, than their wives, than their husbands, than their brothers, than their sisters, than everyone else, including yourself. Yes, including yourself. You would never ever become a true mu'min. You would never ever become a true believer. You would never ever become a true mu'min, a believer. Until the Messenger of Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is more beloved to you than everyone and everything. Than everyone and everything. Than everyone and everything. Why? Because everyone and everything can only give you happiness and content and satisfaction in this world. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friend, your mate could only give you happiness and satisfaction in this world. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the teachings of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam had given you happiness and satisfaction in this world and happiness and satisfaction in the hereafter which is the paradise and that's why he is more worthy of being more beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than everyone. But when we talk about the love of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, we want to talk about the true love of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. Not just I love the Messenger of Allah. Because everyone says I love the Messenger of Allah. I love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We want to talk about the true love of Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam and that true love of Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam that you follow him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You follow his teaching, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You follow his guidance, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You follow his footsteps, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به. Alayhi salatu wa sallam, he says, that none of you will become a complete and a true believer until their entire life and desires is in accordance to my way. What way is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam come with? What's his way? The way of Allah. What's that way? Islam. Islam is the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Islam is the way to Allah. Islam is the way to the paradise. Islam is the way to happiness. Islam is the way to peace. Islam is the way to justice. Islam is the way of success. And none of you will become a true believer until you follow that way. What way? The way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that will take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see that in the companions. Who are truly the greatest heroes that we have after our great hero Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? We see that in the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who indeed gave us the greatest of examples that a human being can ever give, who showed us the greatest 
of examples that a human being can ever show. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum were indeed great heroes. And again, great heroes not only to Muslims, but to every human being to the Day of Judgment. These great companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Starting with Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. The greatest human being after the prophets and the messengers. That the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says, the best and the greatest of faith that stepped foot on the surface of this earth are the faith of Abu Bakr. And some scholars classify the hadith as da'if. The best of people after the prophets and the messengers is Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. That great companion, that great hero, that stood firm by the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. That even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, he says so many a hadith that command Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. But from amongst them, to know how great of a hero this man was, and why the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam loved him so much, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Every single person I proposed Islam to, every single person I spoke to about Islam, every person I invited to Islam had that doubt in their hearts in what I was calling in. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that, every person I spoke to had a doubt whether I'm saying is truth or not. Except one man. Every person I spoke to about Islam had a doubt in the call that I'm calling to, except Abu Bakr. When I called him to Islam, he adhered and surrendered to Allah straight away without any doubt. Allahu Akbar. What a statement. What a statement from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To mirror and commend Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu that every person he says that he spoke to and Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said I knew he had doubt in what I was calling for. I knew he had a doubt in what I was calling for. Except Abu Bakr had no doubts from the beginning. From the first moment the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam told him say Ashadu an la ilaha illallah وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Abu Bakr had no doubts. And no doubts to the moment he met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is that great hero. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says, every single person that owes us, a, that we owe them a favor, every single person that has favors upon us, Every Sahabi, every Sahabiyya, every Muslim at that time that done something good for the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and had a favor over the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam said, I managed to repay them. Everyone that I owe something to them and everyone that done good to me, I managed to repay them except one man. I left Allah to repay him. Because he's done so much good to us. And that's Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. What a hero. What a character. What an example. <coughs> that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was collecting donations from the companions to prepare an army that was going to fight in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam asked from the companions and the, from the Muslims surrounding him in Medina to give whatever they can give for the sake of Allah. O oh, Muslims, donate whatever you can donate to prepare this army that's going to fight and uphold the deen of Allah. So every person came with some of their wealth. Every companion looked at the world they have and they came with some of it. The Umar ibn al-Khattab said, today is the day 
I'm going to challenge Abu Bakr. And Umar ibn Khattab thought that he is doing something that no one had ever done. So he came with 50% half of his wealth. And others came with third of their wealth. And others quarter of their wealth. And others fifth of their wealth. And others 10% of their wealth. And others gave a little bit there. And others gave a little, little bit there. And Umar ibn Khattab came with 50% of what he earns. Bringing it forward to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thinking that no one had challenged him by bringing 50% of his wealth but he was there to be shocked to see Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Not that Abu Bakr came with third of his wealth, nor with a quarter of his wealth, nor half of his wealth, nor the three quarters or two thirds of his wealth. Abu Bakr came with his entire wealth for the sake of Allah, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, this is all I have, it's for the sake of Allah. This is all I own, it's for the sake of Allah. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him, O oh, Abu Bakr, what did you leave behind for your family? What did you leave behind for your children? So Abu Bakr replies back and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I had left behind Allah and His Messenger. I had left behind Allah and His Messenger. I had left behind Allah and His Messenger. And I don't, I don't want more than Allah and His Messenger. I don't need anything after when I have Allah and His Messenger. I'm not in need of anything when I have Allah and His Messenger. Allahu Akbar! What kind of a hero is that? Is that the hero that we look up to? Or Superman and Batman is the hero that our kids grow up thinking of. Where's those heroes in our lives? And they are heroes not because their names were Abu Bakr or Muhammad or Ahmed. They are heroes because of what they did to Islam. What they have did to civilization. What they have sacrificed for Islam. What they have sacrificed for me and you. Do you think we'll ever hear of Islam if it wasn't for their sacrifice? I came from all the way from the other side of the world to this side of the world. And what unites us is that great legacy of those great men. They were indeed heroes. They were indeed great heroes for human beings to hear about to the day of judgment. Abu Bakr brings all his wealth. And remember, Abu Bakr was not a poor man that had only a thousand dollars here. And he said, you know, just give it. I'm poor, I'm poor. He was a rich man. So he had a lot to lose. If you think about losing in this dunya. He had a lot of wealth and he brought it all for the sake of Allah. And he said, this is all for Allah. So what did you leave behind, oh, Abu Bakr? He said, I left Allah and His Messenger behind. Oh, what more do I want when I have Allah and His Messenger with me? These are the heroes. Look at the sacrifice they sacrificed. What do you sacrifice? What do you give for Islam? These people gave their wealth for Islam. These people gave their life for Islam. These people done everything they had and could have for Islam. What do you do for Islam? What do you give for Islam? What do you sacrifice for Islam? That's what we need to ask ourselves that question. And a question that I want you to go home and think about. What do you do for Islam? Abu Bakr came with his wealth, with his entire wealth to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu for Islam. And Abu Bakr is that one example from the thousands of examples from those great companions who were around the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who sacrificed their wealth, who sacrificed their energy, who sacrificed their lives for the sake of Islam. I don't want you to hear about this great hero Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And Mus'ab ibn Umayr was a young man like many of you, young men. And young men and women are those who stood firm by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the beginning of the da'wah. Where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, 
نصرت بالشباب I was supported I was initially supported by the young men I was initially supported by the young women from the beginning of the da'wah and those old ones in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said wa khudiltu bi shuyukh the elderly ones let me down in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was supported by people like himself people like Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiyallahu ta'ala an Mus'ab ibn Umayr was not an old man on the ledge or on the edge of his death he was a young man in Mecca very spoiled so spoiled that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said I have seen Mus'ab ibn Umayr in Mecca and he is the most spoiled young man I've ever seen in Mecca spoiled means he, his mother used to pamper him a lot his mother and father used to give him a lot of money he used to wear the best of clothes and he used to have the best of fragrance and perfumes so wealthy from a young age so spoiled from a young age that people can smell his perfume from distance away and when he heard about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it was that choice for him to make what choice? I either follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and lose everything that my mom and dad are giving me or forget about the call of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and stick into my spoiled life with my mother he had one choice sacrifice everything he's got around him for the sake of Allah and following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or forget about Islam and continue my life this spoiled young pampered man but he came to realize what kind of happiness do I get what kind of happiness do I get if I continue to be this spoiled young man and I miss out on the paradise and the hereafter so he decided to take the first option which was to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in return he lost everything he used to get from his mother that one day the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after being so used to seeing Mus'ab ibn Umayr wearing the best of clothes, the best, best of materials, the best of garments, the best of perfumes. And after he embraced Islam, his mother said, it's either me or Muhammad. So he decided to take Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and follow Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam and lose everything from his mother. So he comes to the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam with old clothes. Now the Prophet ﷺ was so amazed to see him wearing those old poor clothes. So the Prophet ﷺ said, By Allah, I used to see this young man to be wearing the most spoiled, the most wealthiest and the most expensive of clothes. And look at him today. Look at him. Look at him today. Look at what Mus'ab ibn Umayr is wearing today. He left all that for the love of Allah and his messenger. Why did Mus'ab ibn Umayr leave that lavish, leave that stylish life that he had for the love of Allah and his messenger? What do you do for the love of Allah and his messenger? What do you do for the love of Allah and his messenger? Do you sacrifice anything for Allah and his messenger? And Mus'ab ibn Umayr did not only just give up his clothes and give up the perfume that he used to wear, and the money he used to get from his mother but he even gave up his life for Islam Mus'ab ibn Umayr was honored to be the first ambassador of Islam the first Muslim and companion that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam sends on his behalf to Medina to call the people of Medina that within one year, by the time the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated from Mecca to Medina, there was not even one household in Medina that did not have one Muslim in it at least. All because Mus'ab ibn Umayr, this 
spoiled young man. The spoiled, rich, wealthy young man that gave up and sacrificed everything he had for the sake of Allah and His Messenger. For the sake of Islam and for the sake of spreading the da'wah of Islam. And on the battle of Uhud, on the battle of Uhud, Mus'ab ibn Umayr was chosen by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to carry the flag of the Muslims. And this is an honor not anyone gets. Not anyone gets this honor to carry the flag of the Muslims. And the honor was granted to Mus'ab ibn Umayr in which he was fighting with one hand carrying the flag with another. And then the non-believers came the enemies came to Mus'ab ibn Umar to attack him so the flag can fall on the ground. And Mus'ab is carrying the flag with one hand, fighting with the other hand until they chopped the hand that he was fighting with. <coughs> so he grabs the flag and he refuses the flag to fall. This is the flag of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no way I'm going to see this flag drop until I drop. There's no way I'm going to let this flag drop until I drop. There's no way I'm going to see this flag drop when I'm alive. So they cut his other hand. They first cut his first hand. He grabs it with the other hand. So they cut the other hand. So he grabs the flag with his two left over hands. Bleeding. But yet, he didn't look at his arms. Cut off and immutated. He grabs it, refuses to see that flag drop until they came and chopped him and he fell dead. He died. He died for who? For Allah. For what reason? For Islam. This young man, this young man, this spoiled wealthy young man refuses to see the flag of Islam on the ground. That when he died, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wept and cried when he saw the corpse and the dead body of Mus'ab ibn Umayr. That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood on his dead body, his corpse. And he said, by Allah, I used to see this young man to be the most spoiled young man in Mecca. And look at him today. Look at him. He dies for the sake of Allah and his messenger. This young man used to be the most spoiled young man in Mecca and today look at him. He is dead for the sake of Allah. He is dead for the sake of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment he reveals من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عهد الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر Allah azza wa jal will reveal a verse in Surah Al-Ahzab from the Holy Quran to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioning the example of Mus'ab ibn Umayr and those who follow him, those great heroes of Islam where Allah says and states from among the believers there are men. There are men from amongst the believers. Not all the believers are men. There's a lot of males but not men. Men who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sadaqu ma they stood firm and fulfilled their obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other men. The other men in the sight of Allah. The other men in the sight of Islam. The other true heroes of Islam who fulfill their obligation to Islam and do what's required from them for Islam. So Allah Azza wa says from amongst the believers there are men who had fulfilled the obligation to Islam. Some had passed away and others are still waiting. Some had already passed away like who? Like Mus'ab ibn Umayr. He passed away. He's a true man. A true man, a true hero who sacrificed his life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put yourself on the same level as Mus'ab ibn Umayr. You live in Sweden. Alhamdulillah, you have a very comfortable life. I'm sure 
that you don't sleep the night starving like many others out there in this world. And I'm sure that if you desire something, if your parents can't get it for you this week, they'll get it for you later. So you live very comfortable. On the same level of Mus'ab ibn Umayr, if not the same, close to it. But what's the difference between us and Mus'ab ibn Umayr? And what's the difference between what Mus'ab ibn Umayr does and what do we do? He sacrificed a lot for Islam. What do you sacrifice for Islam? We are so attached to this spoiled life that we are living at or in, we don't want to give it up. When Mus'ab ibn Umayr sacrificed everything for the sake of Islam, not only the wealth that he had and the spoiled life that he had, but even his life. And the minimum I should sacrifice for Islam is to act like a Muslim. Behave like a Muslim. That at least when the non-Muslims see me, they could see a good character of Islam in me and say, this is a good man. This is the true Islam. This is the true character of Islam. This is the minimum. The minimum sacrifice I should sacrifice is to have Islam in my life. Present Islam the way the Prophet Muhammad presented it. Let people taste the beautiful gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given me. Wallahi, the best gift that you could give people here is the gift of Islam. Let people see that in your character, in your manners. And be a true hero that people can talk about you later on. Why are we talking about Mus'ab ibn Umayr? Why are we talking about Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an? Do you think if it wasn't for Islam, their name would ever be mentioned? Never! If it wasn't for Islam, Abu Bakr's name would never ever be mentioned. If it wasn't for Islam, Mus'ab's name would never ever be mentioned. If it wasn't for Islam, Umar's name would never ever be mentioned. <coughs> if it wasn't for Islam, Uthman or Ali or Khalid ibn Walid or Abu Huraira and all these great companions' names would never ever ever be mentioned. If it wasn't for Islam, Khadija and Aisha and Fatima and Sumayya and the great other companions would never ever be mentioned. But Islam made them history. And Islam made them heroes. And Islam made them legacy. That we are talking about them 14 centuries after them. All the way in Sweden. All the way in America. All the way in Australia. Everywhere in the world. We speak about these great people. Islam made them heroes. Heroes that make Islam, Islam makes heroes. Heroes do not make Islam. Islam makes heroes. Islam produces heroes. And you could be the next heroes of Islam. When you follow Islam. When you follow the path of Islam. Have that love to Islam. That jealousy to Islam, that care about Islam, that worry about Islam, and act upon the Islamic teachings and you'll be a hero for Islam. A legacy that people can talk about you. You could be the reason that many Muslims in this country who are lost and misguided, you could be the reason for their guidance. You could be the reason for many non-Muslims embracing Islam. And you could be that hero that people talk about you later on. It was because of you they embraced Islam and they said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu rasul. That jealousy. Where is that jealousy in our lives? You know that jealousy? That move, that drive inside you? That when you see someone, for example, crushing your car, something moves inside you? Or someone taking your mobile phone away from you, something inside you moves. Or someone hitting your brother or your sister, something inside you moves. Does that thing inside you move for Islam? Do you get moved for Islam? Do you get moved when you don't pray? Do you get moved when you don't fast? Does something inside you move when you fall into the haram? When you lack deen, is 
there anything, any conscience inside you that moves for Islam? When you slack for, away from Islam? When you miss out on the prayers, for example? Is there something inside you that moves? Does your conscience move? Or you don't care? This conscience needs to move. And nothing moves except the Iman. And that's why if it doesn't move, you lack a lot of Iman. And the way you obtain Iman, you work hard for it. When you work hard for it, you start building Iman inside you. When you build the Iman inside you, that will make a drive, a move inside you. When you see something haram, you keep away from it. When it's time for the prayers, you do it. That drive, where is it in our lives? Let me give you another two heroes. Two great heroes of Islam. <coughs> and when you say heroes, the first thing you imagine is someone over 20 years old. 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. When you mention the word hero, the first thing that comes to your mind is someone above 20 years old. I'm not going to talk to you about a hero or two heroes who were 20 years old. I'm going to talk to you about two young heroes that were only 14 years old. 14 years old. You know that 14 years old these days, the one that's riding his bike or playing the Wii or the PlayStation? These are the 14 years old these days. Well, I'm talking to you today about two 14 year old companions. Great heroes that we are talking about them today. Mu'ad and Mu'awad. Mu'ad and Mu'awad are two great companions. Young companions. 14 years old. 14 years old. Can you imagine? 14 years old. When you think of 14 years old these days, is someone that needs to be babysat when his parents leave the home. These two companions were 14 years old. They were with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the battle of Badr, the first battle in Islam. And initially the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rejected them because they were too young, underage. But then they came and start to say, Ya Rasulullah, I know how to fight, I know how to throw the arrow, I know how to throw the spear, this, that. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted them. And these two young companions, 14 years old, my brothers and sisters, 14 year old companions, during the battle of Badr, while the battle is so heated, and the fight on the battlefield is so hot, so intense, those two young companions will see one companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu his name is Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. And let you hear this story from Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is one of the pioneer and elderly respected companion of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He says, while I was on the battlefield in the battle of Badr, during its intense moment, its hottest moment, while the war and the fight is in, in an intense moment. He says, I was shocked to see two young men. One, his name is Mu'adh and Mu'awwath. Abdul Rahman says, one of them will grab me aside and say to me, Oh uncle, can you tell me where Abu Jahl is? And Abdul Rahman says about himself, I know who Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is one of the leaders of Quraysh. Not anyone can reach to Abu Jahl. I was shocked from the question of this young man. I told him, son, what are you asking about Abu Jahl? What's your concern of Abu Jahl? What do you want from Abu Jahl? So he said, oh, Am, oh, uncle, I heard that he used to abuse the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And by Allah, if I see him today, is it's either me or him alive. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. What kind, of a, what kind of a character is that? What kind of a personality is that? What a man is driving this young man? 14 years old. Saying to Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, 
I heard that Abu Jahl used to abuse the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if I see him today, it's either me or him alive. See that drive, that move in them, the conscious, the iman. And then the other one will come up to Abdurrahman ibn Abu and says to him, Oh, Am, where is Abu Jahl? We don't know him. We are from the Medina. We don't know how Abu Jahl looks like. Tell me, where is Abu Jahl? So Abdurrahman ibn Abu tells him, Oh, son, what do you want from Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl is not an easy man to get to. He is the leader of Quraysh. He's from amongst the leaders of the Arabs. So he says, Oh, Am, I heard him that he used to abuse the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by Allah, it's either my shara or his shara today. Either me or him today. How could I see someone abusing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Or he of him abusing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It's either me or him today. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he says, by Allah, I just turned towards one direction and I saw and I saw a huge crowd. I saw a huge crowd surrounding Abu Jahl. I saw a huge procession surrounding Abu Jahl on his horse. Out of nowhere I told those two young men he is the man that you are looking for. And who's Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl on his horse. A procession. A huge convoy around him protecting Abu Jahl. Abdul Rahman ibn Awfi says, By Allah, the moment I directed those two young men to Abu Jahl, they fled towards him. They ran towards Abu Jahl. Did not even care about those who are surrounding Abu Jahl. And the swords that are around Abu Jahl and the guards who are around Abu Jahl and the soldiers around Abu Jahl they just march towards Abu Jahl to kill Abu Jahl. Why? Because they heard that he used to abuse the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And they managed to get to Abu Jahl. And they killed Abu Jahl. They ran straight to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Each one of them running to give the good news to the Prophet والسلام, saying, Oh Messenger of Allah, I killed Abu Jahl. I killed him for you because of what he used to do for you, what he used to do against you. I killed him for you because what he used to do to you, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he asked them, which one of you killed him? So each one of them said, Oh me, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet وسلم, says, show me your swords. So each one of them, took out their swords and each one of the swords had blood. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, both of you killed him. These are two young heroes, 14 years old. Can you imagine? 14 years old. If you're 14 years old, what do you do these days? And if you're older than 14 years old, what did you used to do when you were 14 years old? These two young companions, Two young men, 14 years old, had that jealousy for the love of Allah and His Messenger and could not accept the fact that there is someone amongst them in, in the battle of Badr, his name is Abu Jahl, he used to abuse the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aren't these guys true heroes of Islam? Wallahi, they are heroes of Islam. Heroes, indeed heroes of Islam. Great men. Great women who are great heroes to the day of judgment because of their actions. Because of their actions. Because of their stance. Because what they offered to Islam. What they gave to Islam. What they sacrificed for Islam. And what we need to know is understand what they did so we could do like them. Sacrifice. Do something for Islam. Contribute for Islam. Give something for Islam. At least have Islam in your life. This is the minimum contribution in your life. Show your friends the true character of Islam. Let them be affected by your character. When the Prophet Muhammad passed away, 
alayhi salatu wasalam did not leave behind bricks over bricks. One of the scholars he says, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is not like every other leader and king who left behind bricks. Great kings, emperors, sultans leave behind as a legacy a great building, structure, bridge, something for them to be remembered. And current kings these days leave behind a beautiful mosque under their name. Leaving behind a structure, brick over brick. One of the scholars, he says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he is not like every other leader who left behind brick over brick, just a structure as a symbol of his leadership. But what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam left behind True men, true heroes, great men and women. What the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left behind, great men and women, great students and warriors and heroes to the day of judgment that we speak about. And the list doesn't end. When you start speaking about those great men, just from the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then you've got the other times from the Tabi'een and the Tabi'i Tabi'een all the way to Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and then onwards great men and scholars and Imams such as Imam al-Bukhari and Imam al-Shafi'i and Malik and Hanbal and Abu Hanifa and then Imam al-Nawi and then Imam ibn Taymiyyah and then great Imams after them the Allahu Akbar our history is full of great heroes my brothers and sisters, our Islamic history is full of great heroes. And what I am saying that with a passion is we have so many great heroes for us to look up to. Why are we looking up to someone else? Why are we looking up to others? Why are we looking up to others? Why are we looking up to the lowest of people? When our history is full of great heroes. When our history is full of great warriors. When our history is full of great men and women. When our history is full of great scholars and imams. When our history is full of great people. Why are we following someone else? Why are we imitating others? This Ummah is blessed. This Ummah, it's, this Ummah is blessed. It's blessed not only with the Quran, not only with the Sunnah, but with the examples that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left for us. We have great men and women in our deen, in our history. Our history is full of great men and women that know no religion. No nation, no civilization has the amount of great men and women the way Muslims have. And this is a challenge. To bring forward the number of people they could bring, as many as Muslims, the number of warriors, the number of heroes, the number of scholars, the number of imams, the number of scientists that this Muslim ummah has. We have so many. We have so many and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with so many. Why are we looking at someone else? Why am I? Why am I looking at someone else? Why am I following someone else? This ummah is blessed. We are blessed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so many. That's why my brothers, let us go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam sunnah. And go back to the teachings of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and take the true heroes as heroes. Take the true heroes as heroes. Take the true examples as examples. Take the true role models as role models. Take those who are worthy to be followed. And remember, every single one of us will be gathered with the ones they followed and loved. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather us with those who we followed and loved in this dunya. A man comes to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says to him, O oh Messenger of Allah, when is the day of judgment? This man wants to know when is the day of judgment. So he comes to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, O oh Messenger of Allah, when is the day of judgment? So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replies back and he says, Why have you prepared for it? Don't ask me when is the day of judgment. The day of judgment is coming and there's no doubt. There is no doubt that the day of judgment is coming. But what you need to be concerned about is what have you prepared for that day that's coming. What you need to be worried about is not when is the day of judgment coming. Why have you prepared for that day that's coming? So this companion, he says, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm an average man. Praise what he needs to pray. Fast what he needs to fast. Pays what he needs to pay. Keeps away from the haram. Follows the halal. I don't do any more extras, but I love Allah and His Messenger. I sincerely love Allah and His Messenger. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replies back and he says, then you'll be with the one that you loved and followed. You will be with the one that you loved and followed. So if you want to know, if you want to know when is the day of judgment, that's a knowledge that no one knows except Allah. But there's one thing you could know. There's one thing you could know is where you're going to be in the hereafter. How? Just look at yourself. Who do you love and follow? <laughs> look at yourself. Who do you love and follow? If you love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and follow him, then you'll be with him in the hereafter. And if you love and follow someone else, then you'll be with them in the hereafter. So there's no way that you could know when is the day of judgment, but there is a way for you to know who you're going to be with in the hereafter. And that's simply look at whom you follow. Who do you love? Who do you follow? And that's why I say, who do you love and follow? Because everyone says, I love Allah and His Messenger. Everyone says that. Every single Muslim, even those Muslims who are at the pubs and the clubs tonight, they all say, we love Allah and His Messenger. Do you follow Allah and His Messenger? So who do you really love and follow? Who do you really love and follow? Do you really love Allah and follow Allah's commandments? And love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and follow his teachings? Or you just love them but you follow someone else? And I think that's the typical answer for many Muslims. We love Allah and his messenger, we follow someone else. Doesn't make sense, yeah? It doesn't make sense to me. And I know it doesn't make sense to you. We need to love Allah and His Messenger and we need to follow Allah and His Messenger. We follow Allah by following His commandments and we follow the Messenger of Allah by following His teachings. And it's something for me to take with me home tonight. Who do I really love and follow? And it's not hard to know the answer because just look at yourself. Look at your actions. Look at the way you live. Look at the way you think. Look at the way you behave. Look at the way you speak. Look at the way you act. Look at your manners. Look at your morals. Look at your concern. Look at that drive inside you. Is it for the love of Allah and His Messenger or is it for something else? My brothers and sisters, we need to love Allah and His Messenger. We need to follow Allah and His Messenger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had restricted and I say that again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had restricted happiness and success for us only in the path of Allah and His Messenger. There is no happiness, there is no success only through the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu There is no other way. Wallahi my brothers and sisters, you live and you continue to live and you're going to experience 
There is no other way. There is no other path. There is no other way and path for happiness and success except the path of Allah and His Messenger. You're not going to get it. Let you be the most wealthiest. Let you be the most richest. And let you be the most powerful, the most strongest, and the most influential person on the surface of this earth. That doesn't mean you're happy and that does not mean you're successful. That doesn't mean you're happy. And that does not mean you're successful. Happiness is only through Islam. Success is only through Islam. You're going to try a lot of things in your life. And you're going to realize at the end of the day, happiness is through Islam and success through Islam. And that's why they were heroes. They were heroes because they lived Islam. They were heroes because their success was through Islam. They were heroes because their life was Islam. We need to live that Islam. We want to live it. Not just talk about it. Not just listen about it. We want to live it. I want to live to be a true Muslim. I want to live to be a true Muslim. I want to live to be a true believer, a true Muslim. That their life is the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My brothers and sisters, let us be also heroes. Learn from those heroes and be heroes. Learn from those heroes to become like them and be heroes that others can inshallah learn from you. Be a hero, not in your strength, not in your muscles, not in your money, in your religion. Be a hero to your brothers through Islam. Be a true Muslim hero to your children. Let your children grow up and say, I had a father who is my hero because he taught me Islam. He showed me Islam. Be a true Muslim hero to your friends. That you'll be the reason that Allah brings them to Islam and they'll say, I have a true Muslim hero that I was the reason that I pray. He's the reason that I pray and he is the reason that I started this deen and implementing the orders of Allah Azza wa Jal. Be a hero for others. Be the reason that you're going to bring people to Islam. Don't be the reason that you turn people away from Islam. Don't be the reason that you turn people away from Islam. You know how we see a lot of people embrace Islam? And we say, Alhamdulillah, one brother, one sister took the shahada. Alhamdulillah, one person became a Muslim because of us. Alhamdulillah. But at that moment we say, Alhamdulillah, we should ask Allah for forgiveness for the number of people that we turned away from Islam because of our actions. The number of people that we could have been the reason they came into Islam, but when they saw something from us, they said, that's not the religion I want to be because his name or her name is a Muslim and I don't want to be a Muslim. My brothers and sisters, we live in a society. We live in a non-Muslim country. We should all be the ambassadors of Islam. We should all be that Mus'ab ibn Umayr when he went to Medina and managed to let every single house have at least one member of its house, a Muslim. Let us all be that Mus'ab ibn Umayr that brings people to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us all be the ambassador of Islam because every single one of us is an ambassador to this religion. Every single one of us is an ambassador to this religion whether we like it or not. We are all representatives of this deen. We are all representing Allah and His Messenger on the surface of this earth through Islam. We are all representing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's shameful when we represent the greatest man with the worst of actions. It's shameful. It's shameful <coughs> when we have the best of cases with the worst of attorneys and lawyers. It's shameful when we have the best of product with the worst of marketing team. It's shameful when we are representing the greatest thing with the worst of actions. We need to represent Islam in the best way. Because Islam is the best, we represent it in the best way. Islam is the greatest way, we represent it in the greatest way. 
We need to represent Islam in the best manners. All of us, every single one of us, every single one of us is a representative to this deen. You are a representative to this deen whether you like it or not. The moment you embrace Islam or the moment you wake up into this dunya knowing that you are Muslim, you are a representative of this deen. You represent Islam. You don't represent yourself, especially in this country. You do not represent yourself. I assure you that, that you do not represent yourself. The only time you represent yourself is the certificate that you take from school or uni. And the money you get from work. But beside that, you are a representative of this deen. So make sure you represent it in the way it should be represented. Make sure you represent it in the way that it should be represented. Do not represent it in a way that Islam is innocent from. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, every single one of you is responsible. And every single one of you is responsible for their responsibility. And we are all responsible for this great responsibility that Allah Azza wa Jal had put over our shoulders. And that's Islam. We are all responsible for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, إِنَّا عَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَا أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَا مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ We had offered this trust to the heavens, the earth and the mountains. Imagine the heavens, the earth and the mountains. And they said, Ya Allah, this trust is too heavy. So Allah Azza wa says, this human being, you, you accepted this trust. And you know what trust? It is the trust of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. This trust is so heavy. This trust is so heavy. Came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This trust is a heavy trust. Came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. You are responsible. You are the trustee. You are the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had entrusted you. He entrusted you with this deen. To spread this deen. To bring people to this deen. To save people with this deen. To guide people with this deen. To bring happiness in the life of people through Islam. To bring satisfaction and content in the lives of people through Islam. That's why we're all trustees of Islam. That we must fulfill our obligation towards Islam. My brothers and sisters, once again, it's my pleasure and honor to stand before you. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the understanding of what we just heard. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who listen and hear and act upon what they listen and hear. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make every single one of you a true ambassador of this deen. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make you the reason that people come into Islam, not the reason that people walk away from Islam. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to strengthen you, strengthen your families and protect you and protect your families. Allahumma ja'alna min al-ladheen yastami'una al-qawl fayyattabi'una ahsana. Jazakum Allah khair. Ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for attending. I'm just having one question. It's like, can I follow the Prophet and all his teaching, taught and what he taught us, the bass and everything, but without changing my style or my own visual outside senses, like, just be me as now I am and acting like a Prophet in his real life? Okay. Islam is about your actions. That's the main thing. Your appearance is a different thing. There are things that Islam restricts us how we appear, okay? Like for example, a woman must be wearing the hijab, a man must have at least, you know, the minimum, you know, at least a bead. It doesn't have to be long, that's a minimum. So there are things that Islam restricts us in our appearance. Beside that, I could appear however I want, as long as I'm not appearing in a haram way. Obviously, there's the minimums in Islam and there's the maximums. Unfortunately, we have not even reached the minimums. 
If I could focus on the minimums, I would focus on my Islam, I focus on my, for example, my prayers, I focus on the time of the prayers, I focus on my fasting, I will keep away from the haram. These are the essentials and that's why, you know, these are the things that we should be focusing on. And then I'll start escalating step by step. I'm not going to be Musab ibn Umar one day and night. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to be Abu Bakr one day and night. That's not, that's not going to happen. But what's going to happen is I could start building up myself. For example, one of the things that I really focus on, I want you to focus on is your salah. Praying your prayers, praying them on time, praying them the way the Prophet Muhammad prayed them. Seek knowledge on how you pray. These are something important for us to know. Okay, move on to the next one. Start attending lessons, even if it's once a week. If there's none in Sweden, at least I listen to a lecture once a week. Educate myself. You know, I always say our parents came from overseas with a little bit of knowledge. We took a little bit of that little bit. So what's left to give our children a dot? You know, I want to ask a sincere question. I want to ask a sincere question. Who could assure and guarantee that their grandchildren are going to be Muslims living in this country? Now everyone starts to think, ooh, that's a hard one. I want you to sincerely think, who can assure, who can guarantee and say, look, I'm going to 100%, I could assure 100% that my grandchildren are going to be Muslims. Not practicing, Muslims. It's a bit of a tough question, yeah? Of course. If we are lacking, what do you expect our children to be? And then what do you expect your grandchildren to be? And that's why one of the scholars, when he came to Australia, he said, if you do not guarantee that the third generation after is going to be a Muslim, you should not even be living in a non-Muslim country. But if, you, if we are lacking, what do we expect our children? But if I'm not lacking, then inshallah I could show something at least. You know, I could see my fruits in my children and my fruits in my grandchildren. I could see that if I'm practicing, if I'm fearing Allah Azza wa Jal, if I remind my children of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us never, our parents never ever one day reminded them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately. So, let's take step by step. Okay, you don't have to... Okay, oh, tomorrow, khalas, go and buy a abaya, have a long bid. That's not something required from you. What's required from you is to focus on your principles and your basics. Good question, inshallah. Any question from the sisters? Do I have a question from the sister? Okay. Okay, wait for the papers to be delivered. Okay, question from the brother, please ask. I hope so. Someone talks bad about the Prophet, what should we, how should we react? Okay, look, in a country like this, you have to react according to the law. You're not going to go and grab a knife and kill him. That's wrong. Okay, you are in a country, you have to abide by its laws. So, if someone talks about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu we react in what we can react in, as long as we don't go beyond the law that we live in. But what we can do is show the true character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. People speak. Even during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they used to speak. But at the end of the day, we, our support to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our, our true support to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, is not just only defending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his enemies, but our true support to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is us reviving his legacy. That's the true support. People will continue to talk to the Day of Judgment. The true support that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu wants from us is for us to be him, to follow him. That's the true support. But for me just to react when someone speaks about him, it's like, you know, and then look at myself, what's the difference? What's the difference between me and the one that just spoke about the Prophet Sallallahu oh, we, we share the same thing. We look like, we think alike. We probably Allah Alam hang in the same place. Yeah, that, that's a reality. Your biggest support to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is to follow him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the biggest support. So if you want to really please Allah Azza wa Jalla, please the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that you follow him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Any other question? Brother Abdullah. My brother. How do you suggest that we work with Dawah here in Sweden? Uh, because most of the people here in Sweden, they are atheists. 
not even uh, have a belief. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are uh, enemies of religion because at the time of the Prophet I mean, it, there was mushrikeen. They worship idols and stuff like that. But today they are atheists. So when you talk about religion, they say no. This is modern yeah. time, you know. I don't even talk about religion. So what's your uh, what's your suggestion? Okay. I'm going to let the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, answer this question. The Prophet وسلم, says in the hadith, إِنَّكُمْ لَن تَسَعُوا النَّاسَ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَلَكُمْ وَسَعُوهُمْ بِأَخْلَاقِكُمْ You would never ever win people ever with your money. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, You would never ever win people ever with your money, but win them with your manners. Manners is the key to the hearts of people. Not what you say, not what you pay, it's the manners, what you do. The akhlaq that made the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his followers. The manners of the Prophet ﷺ was what turned those who used to hate him to become his lovers. The manners of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ turned those who used to fight him to be those who fought with him. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ's manners is what attracted people to him. We lack manners. We lack discipline. Unfortunately, we do lack that. When we have the greatest manners and we have the greatest discipline, and that's the manners and discipline of Islam. That's why most important thing of our da'wah is our manners. People get attracted to you through your manners, through your akhlaq, through your character, through your manners, through the way you deal with them. And that's the minimum da'wah we should offer. The minimum da'wah is I act like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in my manners. And this is the minimum thing that you attract people to Islam. I'll give you a quick story, inshallah, if you could listen to me. A famous story, you probably heard about it. About an imam that was in UK. This imam one day, he moved into a new town. And he was standing on a bus stop waiting for the bus to come. When the bus arrived, he got up, he, gave, he, he, went, he hopped on the bus, he paid the bus, the bus driver the fare, and he went and sat. When he was sitting at the back, he was counting the money that he had in his hands, and he realized that the bus driver had given him extra 20 pence, 20 cents. So he was sitting down thinking about it, you know, should I give him back the 20 cents, should I keep it with me, give it back to him, keep it with me? Well, you know, just the shaitan talking from here, the angels talking from there, you know, thinking about it, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Then when he was walking out of the bus, when he arrived to his destination, he told the bus driver, look, you gave him an extra 20 pence. So he thought the reaction of the bus driver will be, thank you very much, sorry about that. But the bus driver stared at him, started to smile. So the Imam realized that this is not an ordinary smile here. So the bus driver will reply back to him and say to him, I didn't give you that by mistake. So the Imam was shocked. So he said, what do you mean? He said to him, the bus driver, I've been thinking about becoming a Muslim for the last two years. When I saw you, and you look like a Muslim religious leader, standing at the bus station, I said to myself, today is the day I'm going to decide to become a Muslim or not. So I wanted to test you by giving you that extra 20 pence to see if you give it back to me so I could turn to Islam. Or if you were going to walk out of this bus without giving it back to me, I was going to close the door on Islam and I don't even want to think about it anymore. So the Imam walked out, crying, said, Ya Rabb, I was about to sell Islam for 20 pence. I was about to sell Islam for 20 cents. Can you imagine this Imam just put that 20 cents in his pocket or 20 pence, walked out of the bus. He was the reason for this man never to enter Islam again. Subhanallah, look, as, look how small of an action is that. 20 pence. And this, by the way, the bus driver gave it to him by mistake. What about the Muslims? They steal things, they lie, deceive, cheat. How do you expect people to embrace Islam when we have these characters? You would never ever win people ever with your money, but you win them with your manners as the Prophet Muhammad said. Tfadda. Another question? <coughs> it's off. There's a question from the sisters. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I have sinned and made tawbah, but I repeated the same sin three more times. I feel extremely guilty and regretful. I'm too shy in front of Allah. What should I do? I feel horrible inside and I'm so scared of hell. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this nature in a way that we fall into sins. 
And sometimes our desires take over us. And when the desire takes over us, then we become the slaves of that desire. And always desires lead to a very, very dangerous platform. People fall into sins. The Rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jalla upon us, that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala allows us to repent to Him so we could be forgiven. And this is from His mercy. We might fall into a sin, but Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will still give us that chance that we repent to Him. And not only that Allah Azza wa Jalla will wipe that sin away, but Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will delete it away completely from our records, and Allah will turn the sayyat into hasanat. And this is from His great, great mercy and beauty, Almighty. And this is amazes me. Allah creates us, Allah sustains us, Allah feeds us, Allah gives us, we disobey Him, we repent to Him, He forgives us. Subhanallah, how merciful is Allah, how great is Allah, how beautiful is Allah. So someone falls into a sin, they regret committing that sin, they turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek His forgiveness, repent to Him, Allah forgives them, wipes away the sin from them, turns it into hasanat, and it's no longer being asked anymore. But someone says, I repented, then I fell into the sin again. Well, I want to say to you something. Repentance means that you never fall into the sin again. That means if you repented the first time and you fell into the sin the second time, you did not repent the first time correctly. Because if you repented the first time correctly, you would not fall into the sin second time. Because one of the major conditions of an, of an acceptable repentance, that you don't fall into the sin again. That means you did not repent the first time. You need to repent properly, because once you repent, you never fall into the sin again. And someone falls into the sin, they try and repent, doesn't work out, they fall into the sin again. They try and repent, doesn't work out, they fall into the sin again. They try and repent, doesn't work out, Allah forgives. Even if you continue falling and you ask Allah to forgive, at the end of the day Allah had promised forgiveness and it does not shut His gates on you. Subhanallah. Your own father, your own mother, if you come to them one day, I have say, you know what? You mean nothing to me, and everything you've done to me means nothing, I don't even care about you. What are they going to do to you? They're going to boot you out. They're going to kick you out of the house, so you never come back here again. Subhanallah, Allah creates you. Allah sustains you. Allah feeds you. Allah shelters you. Allah clothes you. You disbelieve in Him, then you repent to Him, He accepts you. Allahu Akbar. Your own mother and father don't even do that to you. Allah creates you. He feeds you, sustains you, shelters you, clothes you. You turn away from Him, then you turn to Him. He accepts you, forgives you and says there's nothing between us in the past. Subhanallah. How amazing is that? How beautiful is that? I want to ask you a question. A Lord with those beautiful attributes, does He deserve to be disobeyed? Does Allah deserve to be disobeyed? A Lord with these beautiful attributes, does He deserve to be forgotten? A Lord with these beautiful attributes, does He deserve to be neglected? Allahu Akbar. How beautiful is Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. They had promised that any person that knocks on his gates and seeks his repentance, Allah does not reject him. No matter who he is. No matter what they've done. Let them do whatever they've done. Even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu mentions about a man who killed 100 lives. And this man wanted to repent, so he went to a scholar. A scholar told him, you have to leave the city in and go to another city. So this man walked out of the city on the way he died, between the city that he was going to. Angels from the hellfire came to take his soul to the hellfire. Angels from the paradise came to take his soul to the paradise. So the angels of the hellfire and the paradise start to dispute with one another. Each one of them claims his soul. So Allah sent a judge between them and said, measure the distance between him and the city that he was going to, and the city that he was going with his, um, and between him and the city that he came up from. If he turns out to be closer to the city that he was going to, then let the angels of the hellfire take him to the hellfire. And if he turns out to be closer to the city that he came out from, Afwan, if he turns out to be closer to the city that he was going to, then let the angels of the paradise take him. And if he turns out to be closer to the city that he came out from, then let the angels of the hellfire take him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him closer to the city that he was going to by one hand span and ended up in the paradise. And that's a man that killed 100 lives. Allahu Akbar, how merciful is Allah. 
How forgiving is Allah? So my sister, even though that you've committed the sin once, and you've committed the sin twice, and you've committed the sin three times, you still need to repent to Allah. And remember Allah will accept your repentance, and Allah will forgive you, and Allah will wipe your sins away from you, and Allah will turn your sins into hasanat, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate you. But make sure you repent to Him. And make sure you repent before you die. Make sure you repent to Him, and make sure you repent to Him before you die. Someone might say, you know what? I could do whatever I want, then repent to Allah. Repent to Allah when? Before your death or after your death? Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, once the soul reaches the throat, which is your deathbed, Allah does not accept your repentance anymore. So you might walk out of here. Who guarantees that walking out of here will walk out of here alive? No one can guarantee that. So don't be fooled by the shaitan. When the shaitan says to you, you know what, do whatever you want. Allah Ghafur Rahim will forgive you. When? When? How many people said, I'm going to repent next year? And they died the day they thought about it. So inshallah, ask Allah Azza wa to forgive you, inshallah. There's a question from a sister. What could I do as a young woman to stop being so focused on my appearance? So focused on your appearance. Like... She has a problem, she focuses on her appearance? Yes, she focuses too much on her appearance. Okay. Tell you, there's nothing wrong with focusing on your appearance. Who said there's anything wrong? In Allah Jamil and Yahbul Jamal. The Prophet Muhammad said Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. But as long as you don't you don't do it in the haram. As long as there's no haram involved. A man comes to the Prophet Muhammad after the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look into your looks and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look into your figures. But Allah Azza wa looks in what's your heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks into your action. So a man tells him a message of Allah, how about one of us loves to wear good clothes and nice shoes and that. And Nabi Sallallahu said Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. There's nothing wrong with looking after your appearance as long as it's not done in the haram. What do I mean? Okay, as long as you're not putting makeup and going out in the public, as long as you're not uncovered, as long as you know your awla is covered, you could put makeup for your husband amongst females that you trust. So looking after your appearance is nothing wrong with it in Islam, as long as it's not done in the haram, as long as no sins are committed, as long as in the boundaries of Islam. Islam does not forbid everything from us. Islam allows us a lot of things. Islam allows us a lot of things. But the certain things Islam says don't do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed from the hundreds of thousands of foods out there, Allah allowed 99% of it. Don't eat pork and don't drink wine. People say, what is a ha All the food Allah created for you. Now you just want to focus on those two, three things. But Allah has given you hundreds of thousands of food you could eat. And hundreds of thousands of water and drink you could drink. Why is it when it comes to those things? People, you know, Allah Azza wa allowed a lot of transactions. Buy and sell however you want, but don't deal with riba. People say, is riba haram? You've got a thousand other ways. Why do you have to get a riba for? Subhanallah. Why? You know why? Al Mahdur Marhub. The nature of the son of Adam, we love to disobey. We love to disobey. That's why a teacher in class, stand up, they sit down. Sit down, they stand up. Subhanallah. This is the nature of mankind. We love to disobey. And the worst thing is when you disobey your creator. For Subhanallah, I'm saying that. You could look after your appearance, no problems. You want to take care of your appearance, take care of your appearance. As long as you do not get outside the boundaries of Islam. You don't do, you don't get outside the boundaries of putting makeup, putting perfume on, you know, not wearing the hijab. These are, you are now, got, this is when you're going out of the boundaries of Islam. And which one is more important? Me pleasing Allah or pleasing the creation? I'll tell you one thing. Don't take that from me. Take it from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does he say? And this is an important hadith, a principle for me in life. I want you to take this hadith and put it as a principle in your life that you live with. A principle that your life is based on. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever wants to please people in return of displeasing Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will be displeased from them and Allah will make people displeased from them. So you lose both. And whoever pleases Allah in return of displeasing people, you do things that you know Allah is going to be happy from, and people are not happy. You put on the hijab, you know Allah is going to be happy from you, and everyone else is going to give you a dirty look. 
You do that for the pleasure of Allah and everyone else is not pleased from me. Allah will be pleased from me and Allah will make everyone pleased from me. So who do you please? Who? Allah. If it's a choice between pleasing people, pleasing Allah, who do you please? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without thinking twice. If it's a choice between pleasing people and pleasing Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes before anyone. And you win both. You win the pleasure of Allah and the pleasure of people. But if you take the second option and please people, I'm very sorry to tell you, you lose both. You lose the pleasure of Allah and the pleasure of people. Next question. Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Are you allowed to work as a law enforcer? Are you allowed to work as a lawyer? Okay. A lawyer or police? And it depends on the job and depends what you are doing. There are things, law, police, like every other job. There's halal things in it, there's haram things in it. So it depends what field you are working in. You know, you could open a restaurant. There's halal things in restaurants, there's haram things in restaurants. Okay, delivery. There's halal things in delivery, there's haram things in delivery. Law or working as a police, there's halal things in it, and there's haram things in it. So the things which are halal you do, the things which are haram you keep away from. Now. What do you do if you're an abusing husband? If your abusing husband doesn't want to or refuse divorcing you? Divorcing? Divorcing. Okay. If a husband refuses to divorce his wife, okay, and the wife has a valid reason, whatever reason, yani even if she doesn't want to stay with him, that's still also a valid reason. She needs to go and see an imam. She needs to go and see a sheikh. The sheikh will look into her case. He'll study the case. He'll speak to her and see why she wants to divorce. He speaks to the husband. And then if the husband refuses to divorce his wife, then the sheikh can divorce her on his behalf. So it's a case that it needs to go before the Muslim judge. No. How should a husband treat his wife and what's your nasiha for the one who doesn't treat his wife justly or right? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Quran al-Kareem وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And be dutiful, respectful to your wives. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the wife, the female, is a trust from Allah in the hands of this man. And whatever Allah gives you as a trust must be taken care of completely. That's why a woman must be treated with respect, with honor. A woman must be respected, treated with all respect, with all honor. And not doing so is against Islam. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the best of you are the best to their families, and I am the best to my family. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the best of you are the best to their families, and I am the best to my family. To be a good Muslim, to be a good believer, you have to be good to your wife. And same thing, to be good to the husband. Now obviously what we just said, the West doesn't like to hear that. They love to say, huh, hit your wife, then listen to them. You know, that's what the, the West doesn't like to hear, you know, something good about respecting, respecting the wives or respecting the other side. Well, the reality is Islam commands us to respect, you know, the spouse, commands us to respect the wife, commands us to be dutiful to them, commands us to be respectful to them, commands us to take care of them, he demands us that, you know, we do good. So once again, a husband must be respectful to his wife. A husband must honor his wife. A husband must take care of his wife. A husband must be there for his wife. And it's haram for him to disrespect her in any way or form or not taking care of her in any way or form. Now. Assalamu alaikum. Now you're alive and everyone saw you did on that thing. How you alive? Aren't you the one that the guy shot in the thing? Yeah, but here. Sheikh, my question was if if we are working and we are working with Islam net and these cases for Islam and that, so and we don't have too much time for our wives. So what should we do then? Look, Allah, Islam teaches us. Are oh, you finished? Sometimes somebody is complaining that you don't have time for me. You don't. You are doing this. You are doing that. Hmm. Are you married? Alhamdulillah. So now who are you talking about? <laughs> no, Alhamdulillah. Look, Islam teaches us Islam teaches us moderation and balance. Islam teaches us moderation and balance. Always to be balanced, taking care of it. Take care of my dawah, take care of my family. 
take care of my job, take care of my da'wah and my family. Take care of my da'wah, take care of my job and my family. So Islam teaches us how to balance between those. There is time for da'wah, there is time for family, there is time for work. This time for work, this time for da'wah, this time for family, this time for family, this time for da'wah, this time for work. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during his time, Abu Bakr sees one of the companions. His name is Handal, and he says, how's your day Handal? So Handal says, I feel like a hypocrite. So Abu Bakr tells him, why do you feel like a hypocrite for? So he said, because every time I sit before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and with him, and the Prophet sallallahu tells us about the paradise, is I could see it in my own eyes, like I could see it with my own eyes. Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, I feel the same thing. And therefore, I'm a hypocrite. So they both went to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we feel like hypocrites. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Why? So they said, Every time we sit before you and we sit with you and you tell us about the paradise and the hellfire, we reach to the level as we could even see the hellfire and the paradise in front of us. Once we walk away and mix with the family and friends, we forget everything. So Nabi وسلم, said, Wallahi, if you stay on the same state that you are with me after you leave me, you would have shook hands with the angels. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, Sa'a wa sa'a, sa'a wa sa'a, sa'a wa sa'a, time and time, time and time and time and time. Which means, there are time for you and your family and deen, and there's time for the deen and your family. There's time for everything. The wrong thing about us is to mix both. And I'll tell you something about the family. You know, I'll be honest with you. I, I experienced that a lot. Yeah. It's, we have a lot of the brothers. You know, the wives complain about the husband that, you know, I'll tell you something about the wife. The wife does not really need much time. She needs quality time. Some of the brothers go and spend time with their wife, sitting down on the net, watching TV, talking to their friends. I'm spending time with you. That's not what the wife wants. She wants a bit of a quality time, a bit of attention. And same thing, that's not what the husband wants. The husband wants a bit of time in quality time, a bit of attention. And that's the most important thing. The problem is not spending the time is how you spend that time. And if you respect it, inshallah, you get something out of it. And uh, again, I do focus on the importance that we are a balanced nation, a moderate nation, that we balance between our time, we balance between our thoughts, we balance between our, you know, the way we look at things, the way we deal with matters. So I, I, do, I do encourage the brothers who are involved in the da'wah to be balanced in their time, not to mix the da'wah time with the family time, not to mix the family time with the da'wah time. One of the things that we do in Australia, alhamdulillah, we have a large organization and we do with a lot of things. On Sundays in particular, if we want to do something, we do it with the family. So we don't take the brother away from his family because it's Sunday, at least a family day. So try and always, you know, do something that involves the family and get the family more involved. No. Okay. You told us about your wife, now who are you going to tell us about? Yeah. Zakhar Mahin. For the wives, uh -huh. which is uh, complaining about if we are working from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock at evening, and they are complaining that you don't. How many wives are you married to? <laughs> <laughs> so the first one complains about your time with the da'wah, the second one complains about your time with work? This is not my personal life. No, I understand, I understand. Look, I think the answer that I gave before it speaks about the same relating question that we should be. Balanced in our time, balanced with our da'wah time, balanced with our work time, and balanced with our uh, family time. We shouldn't mix the da'wah time with work, we shouldn't mix the work with family, family with da'wah. Each one has got time, and it's good. You know, what's important is that you come to an agreement with the family, and this is what I do with my family, okay? This is my da'wah life, okay? What do you want from me? This, okay, this is what we agree on, these are the time I spend. With you, with the kids, what do you want from me? Okay, I agree on one, two, three, four. So at the end, I've got this program that I'm going by. She knows about it, I know about it, and there's no clash. So it's just managing your time, which is important. Now, tafadal akhi. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum assalam. Sheikh, from one topic to another. Can you give me clarification regarding Surah Al Mulk? I've read that uh, in different hadith that. It is a protection for us in the grave. In the grave. And at the Yawah Qiyamah. And in the different ahadith, I read that the Prophet he uh, recited Surah al mulk by night. So uh, is it for us to also do it by night or could we do it okay. every day, anytime? No. The hadith says that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged us to read it before our sleep, so at night. So it's sunnah to recite Surah Al-Mulk, Tabarak, Alladhi Biyadihi Al-Mulk, Wa Wa Ala Kulli Shayin Qadir. 
It's sunnah to recite it before you go to sleep at night. And Nabi Sallallahu says it will be a protection for you in your grave and the after. Uh, Brother Fahad, next question. There's a question from the sister that I how can I strengthen my iman? My iman is weak, but I have the heart of wanting to become like those heroes you told us about. Okay, I'm going to give you the, about the iman. I'm going to rush through the questions, by the way. I thought I could see in your hands a fair bit of questions. Now, uh, I just want to give you an example of the iman. Iman is like a muscle. It's like a muscle. You know the muscle in your arm? If you want to strengthen that muscle, what do you do? You train it. If you don't train it, what happens? It becomes weak. This is iman. Iman, take the theory of the muscle. You train it, becomes strong. You don't train it, becomes weak. And that's the same thing with the Iman. Strain it, you become strong. You don't train it, becomes weak. And the way we train our Iman is do more of Ibadah, more prayers, more fasting. Go against your nafs. Going against your nafs is what trains your muscle of Iman. Like for example, when something haram goes in front of you, you lower your gaze. You've trained that. Now you've pumped iron as they say. You're strengthening the Iman. The time where to swear or say abusive words, you swallow it. Now you've trained the Iman. When a husband gets angry from his wife, he keeps it quiet for the sake of Allah. Now he's training his Iman. When the wife gets angry from the husband, she keeps it quiet for the sake of Allah. Now she's training her Iman. You know, when it's time, for example, Salat al-Fajr and get up, now you're training the Iman. But sitting down, it's like you now someone looking at the weights and expects to become strong just by looking at it. It's not going to happen. Iman is like that muscle. You train it, it becomes stronger. You let go of it, it becomes weaker. So if you want a strong Iman, you need to train it. You need to work hard. Now, one of the sisters want to ask a question. Now, sister, ask. I can't hear if maybe the mic is not on. Oh, yes, it's working now. No, it's not working. Yes, yeah, working now, yeah. Like I'm saying, maybe you need to get closer to a sister. Thank you. Who said that when someone drinks alcohol, Allah does not curse him? Allah curses the one who drinks alcohol too. So the haram in general, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does la'na mean anyway? The word la'na in Arabic means being abstained away from the rahmah of Allah. So when you say to something, Allah hilanak, ma Allah curse you, it means ma Allah keep you away from his rahmah. So the one that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cursed a female that plucks her eyebrows, which means that she's abstained away from Allah's rahmah. And same thing, the one that drinks wine, he is also cursed. So it's not, this is cursed and that one is not cursed. It's a good question. Any other question? Can you turn around please, Fahad? Can okay. you Okay. Type. If my sister has a. Okay. Let me say it in a nice way. Okay. Abnormal eyebrows. It's long. Uh, she's got you know like one eyebrow as they say. She can. She can pluck them. She can fix them. Yes. To the state until it becomes normal. If it's extra. If it's excessive hairy or long, then she can do that, no problems. But if it's normal and she just wants to cut it, just fix it, and that, that's where it becomes haram. Uh, any other question? From the brothers, do we have a question? Okay. Okay, in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the evil eye is true, it does exist. 
And the sunnah is that every morning and every evening, in particular after Salat al-Maghrib and after Fajr, we recite Qul Allah Ahad, Qul Azb Rabbi Fala, Qul Azb Rabbi Nas three times. Reciting that three times, inshallah, will be protection and a cure from the evil eye. So, Qul Allah Ahad, Qul Azb Rabbi Fala, Qul Azb Rabbi Nas three times in the morning, three times in the evening, in particular after Salat al-Maghrib and after Salat al-Fajr, inshallah, that will be a protection from the evil eye. Now, and also will be a cure from the evil eye. Will be a protection in Kiwa. Now, any other questions, inshallah? Do you have any more questions, uh, Fahid? Oh, this. I want to formulate uh, two questions for a brother. First question says uh, A brother has done uh, much haram, haram and uh, even when his father died, he uh, became worse. How do you uh, lead him back to the right path? No. Uh, answer the second question. Uh, what are the requirements for doing a dawah? Okay. okay, regarding your first question brother, we do not guide people. We show people the path, but we can't put them on the path. We tell people this is the car, this is the bus that takes you to central station, or the heart of the city if you want to call it, but you can't force people in the bus. You just tell people this is the bus. And same thing as da'is, we tell people this is the way. This is the teachings of the Quran. These are the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu We show them the path. They accept it, it's from Allah. They don't accept it, it's from Allah. We do not change people. People need to change themselves. We guide people to changes. And that's why it's important as a da'i we understand this concept. That I'm not the one that guides people. I'm the one that shows people, not guide them. Allah is the one that guides people. Allah is the one that opens the hearts of people to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yahdi man yasha. Allah guides whoever he wants. Wa yudullu man yasha. And he misguides whoever he wants. If I understand this concept, I am protected from the shaitan. Protected from what? A lot of those who call to da'wah and a lot of those who preach, they think they could change people. So they call, call, call and do a lot of things to change people, but no one changes. So they walk away from the da'wah and say, I've been working so hard in the da'wah and no one had changed. You don't change people. He said from the beginning, you're the one that changes people. You are the one that shows people the way of changing, but you do not change people yourself. The other question is, how could someone, what do we do with regarding the da'wah? Again, I do emphasize the most important thing is us. We become a reflection of the da'wah when we do the right thing. If I do the right thing, I am a da'i within myself. When I said at the beginning of my lecture, be a walking Quran, I'm really emphasizing on that. Be a walking Islam. Be a walking Islam with your character, with your morals, with your ethics, with the way you behave, with the way you do the things, your discipline, your ethics. This is your da'wah. Your da'wah is your manners. Your da'wah is your morals. Your da'wah is your action. Your da'wah is your discipline. Uh, Fahad, what's our next question, inshallah? If sunnah, if sunnah means something optional, then why is it so important to follow the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Okay. Sunnah has got a lot of meanings. Sunnah is the way of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam done things that could be optional or obligatory. But as a ruling, as a hukum in fiqh, sunnah means an optional matter. Okay, a recommended matter that if you do it, you get hasanat, and if you don't do it, you don't get sayyat. Why is it important? Well, sunnah is what protects your fard. And the moment you neglect your sunnah is the moment you start neglecting your fard. So if you care about your fard, you will care about your sunnah. Because the only way to protect your sunnah, your fard, is to protect your sunnah. The moment you start neglecting in your sunnah is the moment you start neglecting in your fard. And sunnah is what perfects your fard. Sunnah, what perfects your fard. A car, for a car to move, you need an engine, you need wheels, and you need the steering wheel. Having doors, would the car move without having doors? Will move. But wouldn't the car look nice if it's got the doors? Wouldn't look even more nice if it's nice color? Wouldn't it even look more nice if you've got a seat to sit on? The sunnah protects your fard, takes care of it. So don't let the shaitan put that in your mind, it's only sunnah. You would never ever, you would never ever lack in your fard 
until you start lacking in your sunnah. So that's from the shaitan when the shaitan says, you know, fard, fard, oh, only look after you, uh, only look after your fard, then look after your sunnah. Why is it when it comes to the akhirah, we become very reckless, we become very restless, we become then care, oh, I don't have to do it. When it comes to the dunya, I want everything perfect. If someone gives you an option, okay, I'll give you, look, you could work for me, I'll give you a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, which one do you want? What are you going to say to him? Give me the thousand dollars? Which, which smart person, the, the, you know, the, the boss offers him a pay, you could take either a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, do the same thing, but you take a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, which one's going to say a thousand dollars? You're laughing about it, because it's true. Everyone's going to say, I want the two thousand dollars. Well, when it comes to the dunya, everyone wants everything perfect. And when it comes to the akhirah, everyone wants everything, everything very little. You know, we want everything so little when it comes to the akhirah. And we want so much when it comes to the dunya. Do you have any other questions, inshallah? Yeah, my question is concerning, you know, if we go back to the time when uh, when Adam was being created by Allah, uh, there's a surah in this world, a uh, ayah in Surah Al-Kaf, which says, وَقُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكِ تَسْجِدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسْجِدُوا تَسْجِدُوا لِآدَمَ إِلَّا إِلِّيْسَ So my, my question is, was the hellfire created when uh, Iblis was being sent down by Allah, or was, it, was the hellfire already created before? Okay. So the question is, was the hellfire created before Adam or not? The hellfire and the paradise were created before the creation of Adam. The hellfire and the paradise were created. And the delil on that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the hellfire and created the paradise. He sent, uh, he sent Jibril to it. And Jibril looked to it. And then, you know, he just said, Ya Allah, I'm, I'm afraid that everyone hears about you know, the hellfire, no one will end, or everyone, no one will end up in the hellfire and everyone will hear about the paradise, everyone will end up in the paradise. So Allah Azza wa Jalla made the paradise to be revolved around hardship and the hellfire to be revolved around desires. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did create the hellfire and the paradise before the creation of Adam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any other question, uh, Fahad? What can protect you from Adam? What can protect you from Adab al Qabr? Okay, we said that Surah Tabarak is one of the Surah that it's recommended for us to read. But also, what protects you from Adab al Qabr? I'll tell you what protects you from Adab al Qabr is the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, where he says, When you're in the grave, the Salah will come to your right and say, I am your actions, I'm here to protect you. And the Siyam will come to your left and say, I am your action, your good deed, and I'm here to protect you. And the zakat will come above your head and say, I am your good action and I'm here to protect you. And the rest of the actions will surround you and say, I'm here to protect you. Another hadith, the Prophet Muhammad says that while the person is in the grave, he'll see a very good looking, handsome man. So he'll say to him, Wallahi, you look like a man with good news. So he'll say, I am your good deeds. Wallahi, you're very quick in obeying Allah, very slow in disobeying Allah. Another and the other hadith continues saying that and the bad person will see a very very ugly fearful man. So he says to him, but Allah you look like someone with bad news. He says to him, I mean bad actions, but Allah you are very quick in disobeying Allah, very slow in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the good actions, good deeds are your protection in the grave. Now you, I heard you say like in our, about that ayah, and you said, Can come refer to this ayah? Is like amana is the soul that we have inside our body. Is not like the Islam. No, no. The amana in this surah is Islam. The amana in this verse is Islam, and part of Islam. You take care of your soul. Yeah, come on, it's like we are not. The, there's a lot of. Okay, if that amana is your soul, why would Allah offer it to the heavens? Why would Allah offer your soul to the earth? Why would Allah offer your soul to the mountains? No, no. The amana in this verse is Islam, not your soul. Your soul is you, heavens, earth, and 
Mountains don't have anything to do with your soul. Allah offered Islam to the heavens, earth and the mountain, then he gave it to that human being. So your soul is an amana. No doubt, your soul is an amana. Is an amana, a trust in your hands that you have to take care of that soul. How do you take care of that soul? You know, if I give you, if I tell you, take care of my son. How do you take care of my son? You feed him the proper food. And your soul needs to eat. Your soul needs to eat. And you know what your soul eats what? It's the, it's the, it's the way you feed your body. You need to, you, the way you need, the way you feed your body, you feed your soul. And the way you feed your body with nutrition and food, you feed your soul with iman and taqwa. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum Alaikum salam. Uh, uh, I've heard uh, about the uh, hadith or uh, from the Quran that uh, Iblis uh, have done sujood on every part uh, of the earth. Is Iblis done sujood on every part of the earth? I haven't heard that one before and I don't think it's true. Okay, Iblis believes in Allah. He doesn't have a problem with believing in Allah. He has a problem with you as a human being. No, but like before uh, Adam was created. No, no, I haven't heard of that and I don't think it's true. But they, they say that Ibli, there used to be the world of the jinn before this world. And the world of the jinn had Yom Al-Qiyamah on them. And amongst the good people or amongst the good jinn in the, in the world of the jinn was Iblis. That's a saying, Allahu Alam. By prostrating on earth, Allahu Alam now. Now, can we have the last questions, Fahd, inshaAllah? Last questions. Okay. Oh. Uh, there's a question, is it allowed to wear a ring? On this pointing finger, as you call it, in humanity. Aywa, the index finger. Sure. Okay, from the point of haram, it's not haram. From the point of sunnah, it's not sunnah either. Okay, you can't say it's haram to put a ring here, because there's nothing that says it's haram. Is it sunnah to put the ring in the index finger? It's not sunnah to put the, in the ring in the index finger. Okay, so put it in any other finger beside the index finger. Better not. Now. What are the conditions and the requirements for giving advice? Okay, when we give a nasiha, we should give a nasiha, an advice to someone the way I like to receive the advice. I give an advice to someone the way I like to receive an advice. So when I want to give an advice to someone, I put myself in his shoe, I put myself in his position and think, how would I accept an advice? Like, you know, for example, sometimes when I give a nasiha to someone in front of people, you this, you that, you this, you that. I don't like someone giving me a nasiha in front of people. I don't accept a nasiha when someone gives me a nasiha in front of people. Nasiha advice. So I give an advice to people the way people, the way I want people to give me an advice. And uh, the best of advice is what's simple and easy. Don't complicate things. Don't complicate things. And one of the worst things that we do as Muslims, and this is, you know, one of the things, when we give an advice to a non-Muslim, you know, in your Bible says that, you know your Bible contradicts itself. Well, if someone says to me, you know, your Quran contradicts itself, I'm not going to happy, I'm not going to be happy about it. When we give an advice to non-Muslims, don't talk about their Bible. Don't talk about their book. Offer them what you've got. This is the Quran. Then, then tell, oh, in your Bible this, you've already put yourself He's already, you put him on the offensive side, that's it. He's on the defense and he's offended by you and he's not going to listen to you. Don't oh, but you, you're, you're this, you're that. Okay, this is what we've got Islam. I'm not talking about your Bible. I'm not talking about what you believe in. I'm talking about this is what I've got. It's better than what, you know, it's the best thing I have. Take it. So this is uh, regarding that. Now, another question, inshallah, last question. Question. Does Shaitan pray Salah? Does Shaitan pray Salah? If he prays, it's not accepted. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> Some hadith has no connection with the Quran. Should still believe in them? Some hadith? Some hadith has no connection with the Quran. No connection? Should still believe in them? Okay, no connection? That's what he said. Okay, this is wrong. Because the Quran says what the Prophet said. This is wrong. I'll clarify that. Everything the Prophet Muhammad says, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muhammad does not say anything from his own. It's only a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything the Prophet says, as a prophet and a messenger, it's from Allah azza wa jal. And we are commanded to take it. 
There's no such thing called hadith not connected to Quran. The Quran and hadith are connected to one another. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warns. He warns from that. He says someone relaxing on his sofa, saying, I only take what's in the Quran and whatever beside that I'm not going to take. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ba Allah, whatever Muhammad says is what Allah says. Whatever Muhammad says, it's what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says. The authentic ahadith, we're talking about the sound and authentic ahadith, they're all connected to the Quran, they're all from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, a revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. The wording is from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's the difference between Quran and uh, the Sunnah. The Quran, the wordings and the meaning is from Allah. The Sunnah, the words are from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but the meaning is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. They are connected to one another and Allah Azza wa Jal commands us in the Quran al-Kareem وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the Prophet comes forward with, you take and whatever he forbids you from, keep away from. So the Quran and the Sunnah are connected and there's no such thing called they're not connected. Now, How do you protect yourself from falling into arrogance? How do you protect yourself from falling into arrogance? Obviously, every single one of us has arrogance in them. But it depends how we let the arrogance go up or down. Everyone's got this arrogance. Everyone's got anger in us. Everyone's got happiness. In us. Everyone's got feelings. It depends how we let it go up and down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah Azza wa does not love, Allah does not like people who are arrogant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like people who are oppressors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like people who are ignorant and arrogant. If I want to teach myself not to be arrogant, then I have to pay attention. Okay, if, I'm, if I am ill, I have to take a medication even though I find it hard on myself. Sometimes you take, you know, the cough medicine and it's so sour, but you still take it. And the medicine for you to not to be arrogant, arrogant is that you pay attention, you listen. Okay, your nafs is telling you to be arrogant, but okay. Or someone's talking to me and my soul or myself is telling me to be arrogant. What do I do? I do the opposite. This is stop paying attention. I start doing what I need to do not to be arrogant. So I go against what arrogance tells me that. And at the same time, you know, uh, listen to the, uh, the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu on how humble he was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the greatest example of humbleness. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This teaches a lot in our character. The seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is important in our life. The seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is important in our life. Why? Because it teaches us who to become and how to live our life. Okay, if I had last question, inshallah, that's it. We'll take last one, inshallah. Because it's getting late, I don't want the brothers and sisters here to stay late. Then, then I'll get in trouble. And we have heard that uh, if you fall, if a scholar makes an ishtihad and he gets right, he gets two rewards. And if he is wrong, he gets one, he gets reward. one reward. But if someone who is just following a scholar, he follows a scholar without doing any research, but he ends up following the scholar who made the wrong ishtihad. Mm. Uh, would he get punished for that? Even if he knows that the other opinion is safer. But he will chose to follow the okay. scholar. Now this is, uh, I was expecting another question that's not going to take that long, but this one needs a lot of clarification. So I'm going to answer it in a quick way. At the same time, if you didn't understand exactly what I'm saying, then it needs a lot more clarification. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says there's two types of judges. One judge, one judge that makes a judgment and it's correct, he gets two rewards. The other one makes a judgment and it's incorrect, he gets one reward. Now me as a common person, I follow the Imam and the judgment that he makes. But which Imam I follow? An Imam that I know that he trusts, I trust him and I know that he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't follow an Imam because my desires tell me. Like someone comes up to me, Shaykh, is riba halal or haram? Haram. What kind of a Shaykh are you? I'll get to the next door, masjid and ask him if riba is halal or haram. They fatwa shopping. You know, people are just you know, trying to shop around for a fatwa that suits them and suits their arrogance or suits their mentality. But if I'm following an Imam that I know this man fears Allah Azza wa and I'm confident to what he says, then if me following him, there is no problems. But if I'm following him, I'm doubting, then there's a problem because there's a doubt in me. If I'm following an Imam, 100% feel confident in the ruling of this Imam and it's based on Quran and Sunnah, what, yeah, and this Imam is, is God-fearing, then it's okay. But if I'm following someone I know deep inside, you know, it's like, you know, someone comes and tells you, is it haram or halal? Uh, is riba haram? You tell him it's haram, uh, guess to someone else. Uh, then the sheikh tells him it's halal. But deep inside, he knows it's not. He just wants to get, you know, a fatwa. 
Tab subhanallah, Allah is going to judge you over that because inside you, you know it's something that you're not content with. And that's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he answered that question to us. He said that, Al-bir, matma'annat ilayhi nafs, matma'annat ilayhi al-qalb. Al-bir, goodness, is what the heart feel, feels content and satisfied with. And what the soul feels content and satisfied with. Wal-ith, mahaka fi nafsika, wa taladdada fi qalbik, aw sadrika wa karahta ayya tali alayhi nas. And evilness is what you feel uncomfortable with. You feel not content with. And you find within yourself there's no satisfaction. And then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, and you hate people to see you doing it, even if people give you fatwa. Even if people give you fatwa. Even if you get a shaykh and he gives you a fatwa of a matter, but deep inside you know it's not acceptable. That fatwa means nothing. You've just, you know, what well, these days, you know, you could get a fatwa. What's so hard? You know what, don't even, you make your own fatwa. <laughs> people, what's, what's so hard about that? It's about the reality of the matter. It's about the truth. It's about how you feel towards it too. You know, someone tells you, Allah, it's halal. And deep inside, you know, it's not halal. But you're going to do it, oh, he's going to be responsible for it. It doesn't work that way. He's playing games on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa billah. You can't play games. So that responsibility goes back on you, who you choose. And subhanAllah, when I'm sick, would I go to any doctor? If I go to a doctor and he gives me my medicine, I know that medicine is not good for me. I'm going to take it. I'll say, oh, you know what? It's not good for me. I'll take it to his responsibility and then I'll die from it. No one does it. Subhanallah, which one is more important? The doctor for your soul or the doctor for your body? And the shaykh is like a doctor for your soul. So if you're not going to be, the way you are cautious not to take the wrong medicine from the doctor, you should be cautious not taking the wrong fatwa from a shaykh. I ask Allah Azza wa to make us from amongst those who listen in here, act upon with the listen in here, brothers and sisters in Sweden, in Stockholm. It's been my absolute pleasure and honor to be amongst you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for attending. And I want to you know, send my greetings and gratitude and thanks to the brothers who had helped us here. Brother Ahmad, Brother Samir, and the rest of the crew, Brother Abdullah. And I'd like to name each one of them. But I can't remember their names, so forgive me if I don't. Okay, Brother Hamza, Liban, and the rest of the Stockholm, and the rest of you, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your time and effort. I really appreciate every single time that we spent with you. I also want to thank Brother Fahad and his crew and his team, his family, his father, his brother, and the rest of the brothers who came from Oslo, from Islamnet. They've been working very hard. They've been working very hard into organizing this event and other events. Last year I was in Oslo, Norway, mashallah. The brothers organized a fantastic uh, a conver a conference, a peace uh, conference that took place in Oslo. And inshallah, I look forward to see something like that taking place in Stockholm, and that's not far away. And uh, just before you leave, if you could support the brothers with whatever you can support them with, you, you know, support them with your finance, support them with your nice words, support them with your support, support them with your uh, merits, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Uh, Jazakumullah khair for being with us. I look forward to see you again in the future. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you steadfastness. And one day, inshallah, this place will be full of brothers and sisters who are all working together, one, supporting one another for the sake of the da'wah, for the sake of Islam, for the sake of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullah khair once again. And may Allah reward you. And don't forget us in your du'a. Show the show.